Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this fun live stream uh, by Toon Boom Animation. It is either on Twitch or on YouTube, so just pick pick your favorite. We we don't make we don't make favorites here, just choose. And to, and uh, I am Mel. Also, my name is Marie Eve, but no one can say that. So let's just go by Mel. You might also know me as Z from the Z Bird Brain channel. I have many secret not so secret identities and today i am joined with a wonderful artist which i will let themselves introduce you to what is your name lovely artist with me on the stream <laughs> a bit of everything that is cool <laughs> um yeah so i thought that Storm Star slash Michelle was the perfect guest for, for us to have today because the subject is paperless animation. So for those of you who don't know, uh, 2D animation comes in a variety of different styles, including cutout animation um, and hand-drawn animation. And usually what a uh, hand-drawn animation, when it's taught, when it's done digitally, like on an animation software, this is what we call paperless animation because it is still frame by frame, like paper animation. But you know, there's no paper involved because it's digital. So we call it uh, paperless animation. Um, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. <laughs> As usual, if you guys have any questions, you can write them in the chat and I will make sure to uh, give a look and answer what we can. Of course, we cannot share anything NDA related and, um, you know, like keep, keep, keep the conversation professional, folks. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun. Of course, this is recorded and will be available very soon on the YouTube channel of Toon Boom. Okay, so... Let's get started. So first, a couple of questions for our lovely guest. Um, thank you for introducing yourself to us. But um, may I ask you, uh, what school did you attend or how did you learn to do that lovely craft of paperless animation? Uh, I looked a lot into it before going to school. So I knew like mm -hmm. I wanted to get into it that way. I did a lot of drawing and sketchbooks. I did a lot of, I guess, just geeking out about animated movies. I remember when we had the the video feature on the Nintendo DS. I would uh, videotape different clips on the VHSs across the television, and so I can go frame by frame. Be like, what does this do? How does that work? Ended up going to college. Got through three years of that hopped out into the pandemic and went, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not easy, not easy. Um, okay, I'm just checking if we have the, the chat working. Okay, chat is working. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so yeah, because um, we often talk about like, what school did you go to in these chats, but rarely like, what got you in like motivation and stuff. But yeah, making studies and everything before going to school, is so important because I don't know if you'll agree with me, <laughs> but even if you take a course or you go to a school, the school will not teach you everything. It's there to teach a solid basics and you know a bunch of soft skills also that come with depending on which uh, education you guys go through. But it's not everything, and there is a lot of learning that you'll have to do by yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is just nice to have that environment as well. It's really mm -hmm. forced to sit there and really deal with it. Yeah, yeah. There is no escape, unlike your personal projects. You go, oh, I'm bored of this. I don't want to do it. Then you stop doing it. Yeah. Um, like uh, today's subject, and not, not specifically about education in school, but just because it's such an important subject, I will mention on my YouTube channel, I did a couple of videos talking about like how to get education and animation because, uh, you know, school is not everything. While I will say personally that I do think school is very, very important and very, um, um, it does make the learning easier, but at the same time, it's not, it is true that school is not available for everyone and not at a fair price uh, as well. Oh yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, like I was lucky to have a public school to learn animation, but I understand it's not the case for everyone. So if, out here, you're listening. Uh, you're making um, 
a first good step of finding education where where you can and to boom switch channel is a good opportunity there's also a bunch of very educative youtube uh, channels and stuff but my point that i want to make just before we move on <laughs> to another topic <laughs> is that learning tutorials is not the is not shouldn't be the only thing you do to learn and um and i recommend finding a community to learn with this may be on discord this may be like a group locally in your city i don't know but find people because these people are going to hold you accountable uh, in a healthy way like not peer pressuring you <laughs> yeah, like, do it or else we want the next episode next week yeah right not, not that kind of accountability but i know that uh, michelle and i are part of a discord server where it's a community of artists and each week we have like these little channel uh, uh, challenges and stuff so just a group of people that can help you out when you need and lift you up so find a community don't stay alone in your basement studying animation this is this is not healthy so yeah find a community and learn through that anything to add friend yeah, I'd say finding a group is really important. Like, the internet's a big, wide place, and for a uh -huh. long time, I joke that I've been hiding under a rock because I'm terrified of the idea of being out there, and here I am on a live stream. And here you are on a Twitch. I'm so, I hope you're proud of yourself, because that's amazing. Yeah, it's just nice to have a small community that you can bounce ideas off of, see what works, see what doesn't. You just, like, find who you are online, sort of, because oh, when you're yeah. a person, you're almost, like, trapped a little bit by the people around you. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I see you doing something. What are you doing in Harmony right now? There are some cool squiddly diddly um, timing charts that are interesting to see. So there's a lot of things going on. Would you mind uh, taking us through your little process right here? Yes, doodling some griffins. I like to doodle birds a lot. Griffins just they're still fun. Bird. I think we agree on that. <laughs> yeah, we agree on that. Birds are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very like loose and they work well with gesture drawing. So even if you don't really know what you're doing, they can turn out kind of cool. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun to work with the the spacing as well because you can just go swoop around corners. Honestly, yeah. When I don't know what to animate, I usually default to like little fast paced action like that like either like a little bird or a bat or something flying in the screen because it's gonna look great and you don't have to worry too much about like keeping your thing in on model like from very close in between because oh my god and um i think that that is one thing i i think that's like a misconception that goes around where people are like, I'm going to animate something that barely moves because it's easier. It's like, <laughs> barely no. moves. Right? Like, like when it's is something rock. that um, maybe like, like a, a headshot of a character expressing and talking, I'm like, that is not easy. You have to keep the face on model, do subtle expressions. Like, to me, a bouncing ball or a flaying ribbon like that, you can get away with so much more than a very expressive, like, headshot of a character. But maybe Ooh. that's just me. <laughs> Yeah, I think it'd be even harder to go really close up because at least when I'm far away, I can like experiment a lot with the shapes. But and when you're gesture. close up with the character, you have to be on model and you know all the little subtleties in the face, like the eyes face the wrong way and it looks dead. Very close in betweens. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of extra stuff there. And what I love in what you see is that uh, is what you made is that you have the layout with like the little um, line with the check uh, the little checks on it. Um, I love 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 to use these when I teach because I think it it breaks the stigma of like timing sheets are evil. Therefore, I will not use them. <laughs> or like I don't understand what timing charts are because usually like um um like if if you look at like James Baxter's like these or like Disney's animator and stuff, they, they put their charts on the side of the sheet because they're used to it and they know what they're doing. If you're learning animation, I think one of, one of the best way to start to learn these time charts or timing sh uh, time uh, or spacing charts, as they're also called, is try to just make a movement. And each little check that Michelle is doing will be where the character will have like a, like a pose in a way. 
So the further apart they are, the fastest. Like you have this very quick airplane griffin going through. And yeah, then when it's they're really high, hard, oh. and take a slow corner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I saw timing charts originally, and they were like put on the side where you would just mm -hmm. have a straight line, and they'd be like, here's your key, here's your key, here's frame 29, and then frame, I don't even know, 37, and then you have little ticks here and there. These little bits there broke my brain. <laughs> because it'd be like, when I see this, I think it's going in a straight line. So if this is supposed to be like, an overshoot or a saddle or even just an ease. It, it doesn't read well to me. I see too many numbers, too much math. Like, no. If I have something like a character that's going to maybe I just delete this for a second. Sketchy, sketchy. And I know, like I get these one now, but I've been working in animation for 10 years. When I started, I tried to understand it and it just I was like Eh, how do I visualize? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, just being able to create the motion path and then work across it worked better for me. Like if I knew I needed to do something mm -hmm. in say 30 frames and I think, okay, well, if I'm working on threes, that gives me 10 little ticks. And if I want a oh, simple like antic overshoot, if I have a character starting there, I want them to do a little antic downwards, but I also want them to arc this way. And then I can have it go up as an ease out. The big action can go down the side, keeping arcs in mind, and then a little overshoot and come back up. That to me reads easier because I have my key. The anticipation is there. I can get to the top of the arc. Maybe this is a smear if it's going really quickly. Mm -hmm. Overshoot, a little room for settle. It just reads in my head better than something like this yeah. does. Mm -hmm. It does make sense. <clears throat> and also for people who are listening now, um, knowing how to do your timing charts, I, I am confident that it becomes better the more you do it. And also the more animation language you get, because when you start out, you don't know anything. <laughs> you don't know how much images do, how much frames do I need for a jump, for, for, for a run, for, for a turn. So as you animate, the more you're going to animate, the more familiar you'll be with like the timing of things. So that when you have these charts, you'll know that, oh, if I want to make a jump, maybe I just need four drawings. And then you know how to space them and stuff. So... Yeah, it, it'll get there. Don't try to don't 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 be too hard on yourself and just be patient. <laughs> oh, these are some nice legs. <laughs> <laughs> Big leggies. I was so shocked when I saw some pictures of owls, and you'd think they're just like tall creature with little tiny legs out the bottom. But oh, then, they have giant see... Legos. <laughs> yeah, they're like all the way up there. Did you see the person who just lift them up with like their hand on their uh between like the the, the two thighs yeah. and they just lift it? It's like these long these long yeah. legs. Oh my god! Secret life of gesture birds. drawing is important, folks. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> the long leggies. I think this weekend I'm gonna do go on the server and make a <laughs> live drawing thing, and it's just gonna be weird, weird owls, little horns too. Oh yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And even just owls, they're so different. There's like boring owls, there's barn owls, there's pygmy owls, there's horned owls. They all look so different. So yeah. That's and something I really like about being able to animate cute. animals. Is there's so many different kinds of them. And they can all be yeah. expressive in their own way. And I think a lot of people are scared of animals. But honestly, I think it's like you have to think about it more into shapes and locomotion than like... Um, sometimes I think it helps make the animal less complex. Just break it into shapes and, and try to see how it moves. It's so fun. They're just lines and shapes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I tend to think like predatory animals you think like dogs or cats really rough drawing there <laughs> but they're <laughs> obviously going to come forward because they want to catch things 
Whereas if you have yeah. herbivores, like horses that are going to be running away, these kind of go the other way. <laughs> All horses. <laughs> yeah. Everything of like, wait, how does that work? Little leggy. I drew so many horses. <laughs> Extra He's getting there. Yeah, that's a good horse. Good <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, okay. While, while, while you doodle this lovely owl, I am curious. What is the hardest thing to get when you start learning animation? Like, when you're just starting, what was the biggest hurdle for you? Because maybe this will be relatable to some people listening and they'll be like, ah. Oh, I am not alone. <laughs> Aside from the drawing skill itself, because I think 3D does have some advantages in that regard. When you're 3D animating, you're not worried about things going off model. So if the animation looks wrong, you know it's your animation. It's not your drawing. You got to be able to figure that part out. Though I do think the hardest part for me was the timing charts because I wasn't given away sort of process them in a smooth shape. I was told you need to make a key, make your other key, do a breakdown and make something happen in the middle. And I ended up doing a lot of, like, oh, Tumbu. I ended up doing a lot of straight ahead because I didn't quite mm -hmm. understand the timing charts. And then I would run out of space. I think that was also a mistake. I worked a lot on twos. So if I was trying to animate something, I have my little owl moving. And if I thought I needed another pose, now you need to make extra space. Whereas if you work on threes, it holds longer, your poses are more important, it saves you work. And if you need an extra frame, you can just grab those two, delete it, and now you've got space. Amazing. Um, no, no, no. Oh, okay, that's a good question. I love to ask in these little chit chats. What are some things you learned on your own versus in school or from like a a path of learning? Um, because when, when we learn animation, when, when we work in animation, <laughs> we learn things that are wildly different. Things that I learned on my own. Ooh. Versus like at uh, on your work. I think this question can help like from the, the context, like it's if a viewer is listening and um, sometimes people are like, oh, I feel like my school is not teaching me anything or I feel like what I know is not gonna be useful for work. So like, you know, some things that you've learned at school and at work, like in how kind of maybe different they were. Or like something you learned at work that you didn't learn in a school or vice versa? I think something I learned working with other people is the importance of not saying yes to be like agreeable and easy on the team. If you don't understand something, you need to say something sooner than later. Like if you need oh, clarification, ask for it right away. If you're given, a, if you're handed a scene and you think, okay, it's good to go. You get some feedback notes and they tell you, hey, can you change the way this happens? Something happens. Maybe they don't like the pose. Maybe they don't like the effects that you're using or in-betweens. And your first reaction might be, yes, I can change it. I can do that. And then you run back to your desk and you sit down to do it. And you stare at your file and go, change it how? And you don't know. And then if you don't ask, you take a guess, you do it wrong. You don't save time. Everybody has to do it again. So yeah, ask questions. That is such an important point. And I read another interview on my YouTube with Chris Pern, which is... No, it was not Chris Pern. Was it Chris? Hmm. I think it was Chris Pern. Might not be. Maybe it was Dan Milano from Glitch Text. I don't know. But one of these two uh, director, like they direct stuff, they told me... Um, a very important thing it's uh, it's okay not to know it's like it's okay to say i don't know when you're in a production process um oftentimes 
uh, we have this impression that we have to know everything, including if you're a director, but like you are not alone in this. You have peers, you have teammates, and it's okay sometimes to say that you don't know something um, because we're in a creative business. We find solution <laughs> creatively. So yeah, that is such an important point. Thank you for bringing it up. Very, very important. Being able to ask yeah. for help is cool too, because you can channel what other people. Yeah. Can. Yeah, they have knowledge that you don't, and you save time going through Google. Like if it's something really it's simple. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was thinking if it's something really simple, maybe Google it first. That way you're not bugging somebody for something really simple. But if you can't find yeah, it. Yeah, rule of thumb. If it takes you more than 10 minutes to Google it, you can ask someone. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it's okay to say you don't know because sometimes if you pretend that you do know, uh, you it might just be, you know, it might just be make more problems. So be humble, folks. Um, uh, love, love, love that answer. Um... Yeah, you might even find a new way of doing something. You thought you knew what you mm -hmm. were doing. Someone else has a more efficient way of doing it. Oh, that's a good one, too. Um, oh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about design. So when we animate, you know, there's a difference between <laughs> character design for a comic, <laughs> for a graphic novel, or like for, for, for a book or for, for animation. And... Uh, even in animation, even in animation, depending on what medium you choose, like is it cut out paper, is it cut out puppets, uh, digital cutout, or sand, or claymation, clay claymation, or or hand drawn animation, the design is so important. And knowing your medium, having your medium in mind, is even more useful because then you can design um, so that it's helpful to your medium. For example, design, designing for um, cutout animation and hand-drawn animation is different. Um, do you have some advice for designing for paperless specifically, like the hand-drawn animation? I'd say if you're doing something that you're just using as a small project or testing, do something simple like this little owl critter. He's a circle with <laughs> a little V on his head little shape. You can bend them around a lot. It's not going to take long to draw from different angles. If you start getting into something really complex, you know, like, I've got a dog, like, um, African wild dog. I always wanted to animate one, so I went in with it knowing it was a challenge, but uh, I would not recommend doing something like this if you <laughs> just want to experiment. That even with all the different contours that I need to keep track of, that's going to take way longer than the little owl is. So I do yeah, think it's there a is a way to but... approach it. <laughs> Sorry, you're saying? Oh, I was just saying it's a fun exercise, yeah, but not if you're trying to learn animation. Like you already know how to animate. This was just experimenting the this one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't approach like, an African wild dog as your first time. <laughs> like, I'm going to do a run cycle. And then you have all these extra little patterns to keep track of. Oh, and I think when I look at this uh, character, like, I think this is great and fun if it's your project. But if I had to make a project with people, I would, because I don't, I also make my own stuff. And sometimes it's pretty complicated, but it's my problem. I would, mm -hmm. I wouldn't give that kind of very detailed design to other people to animate a production, for example. Uh, because then not only you will have to keep track of it, but you'll make sure to, that everybody does keep track of it and bottleneck and stuff. Because we see it often in, in the animation where the designs are really too complicated for the animation just because oftentimes there's no one being like, ah, this design is over budget <laughs> because sometimes the budget is handled by like a person doing the project. So. Um, if you intend on making it a project with other people, remember it's good to streamline and simplify your things. Oh yeah, like <laughs> I would never show hand us? Kiwi to somebody else. Like, when I designed <laughs> her, I knew I wanted to animate her, so I tried to keep some things in mind to help make it easier for myself. 
like I tend to construct the dogs in a way where they have the shoulder, the elbow, uh -huh. the forearm, the wrist, and the paw. So I could break that down into the different sections before adding the extra patterns on top. So like one leg would just be black, black, a little swish with the brown, solid color, solid color. And I would animate those first. And then once I had those bits anchored, I could go back in and add the extra details that break yeah, up. Yeah, because the, the details are pattern. still organic. Yeah, they're organic into how the dog is, is designed. That's really cute. It's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the hardest thing with the wild dog is that they have a really stiff tail. There's yeah, I've seen that in references. Because I always want to make it like, uh, I have my little note page here. I always wanted to be like, follow through with the tail. You have your nice S curves and C curves, but it just had a very, yeah, it was so stiff. But then I guess that just comes from looking at references. You think, oh, it's not behaving how I thought it was. So I have to work around that a little bit. But that's the fun part of animating animals. Like you said, it's just so fun to, to, to see that nothing is all the same. And yeah, yeah. super fun, beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful dog. <laughs> I love painting dogs. I discovered them on, on Wild Kratz years ago and I was like, they're so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely see a lot of animated cats. So doing a dog is something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Which they're definitely a lot stiffer. Like cats are very bendy. You can, have, you can draw like a little squiggly shape and a cat will probably fit in there. Bendy catto. <laughs> Dog, not so much. Except greyhounds. <laughs> They're so flexible. <laughs> They're like <laughs> dog cats. C cat dogs or something. And they have the really long... Uh, I think I want to say a snoot, but it's not a snoot, it's a snout. Snout. <laughs> yeah, and they have a very, very flexible spine. I love them so much. <laughs> they always have like the crazy wild eyes to like, they're always anxious. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, that looks like my dog. <laughs> Poor dog. <laughs> Um. Oh yeah, I was about to ask you so when you design, because I know how you design. You usually design with paperless in mind, which is great. Just like the painted dog that you talked about, um, having designs follow the locomotion of a character is such a good idea, because sometimes you can make designs that go against like the the muscle flow or like the flow of the character. Mm -hmm. and uh, it be it becomes harder to animate though sometimes it can be great because it, it can do like misleading details kind of like a camouflage kind of thing because if you have a detail that follows the flow of the the whatever you're you're drawing it'll help read the animation if that's what you want but when you understand this rule it's so fun to break it and then it can make your character look like something it's not intending to in a way so that, that can be very nice. I think they had some things in Princess, Princess and the Frog where like, if a character stood a certain way, like some markings on like, I think it was like these kind of tiki heads make them look like something else, which was really cool. Oh, did they? they? Were, I yeah, remember seeing an animation test of that come out not too long ago, but yeah. I didn't notice anything. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, surprise people with design. Or like if, if an animal, when an animal stands, because they do that in real life, when an animal stands still, sometimes the markings show like, you know, like these bugs that when they stand still, they look like the, the bird of a, the head of a bird. And then when they move, it's like, oh, actually not. This is so fun. I want to animate that at one point. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Like the it's like Transformer meets life. animal. Yeah, that's so nice. Or like the caterpillars whose butts look like an og or like a snake face. It's so interesting. <laughs> Study nature, people. It's a great animation teacher. <laughs> um, okay, little, little animation questions. What are for you some easy things to animate? Oh, that's so cute. I love this little animation. <laughs> yes, to do a little flop. Boop. Things that are easy yeah, for me. What are in, is some, some specific easy things for you to animate? Uh, like I mentioned, I like doing birds. They tend to be quick circle, little triangle. Then you can just play around with shapes. 
Um, I'd say some, like, anything that doesn't have really long limbs. Because once you start getting into, like, the really long dragons, as cool as they look, you gotta start paying attention to all these overlapping bits. And if you try and animate them moving at all, to try and keep the size of things like this neck consistent, if, I don't know, this dragon's gonna go over here now, that's mm -hmm. not the same. So that's gonna look weird if you try and in between it. So if you're going to try animating something, I'd keep it either round, or square, and keep it small. Keep those little chibi creatures with the little yeah. stubby. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful to watch these drawings unfold. I'm going to check the chat for a question. Questions, questions. Um, let's see. I refreshed the page. We don't have a question, but on YouTube we have Scott Forbes or Forbes or Forbes who says, Oh, the path is a great idea. Thanks. So I think that was for the the spacing chart. So yeah, it's a great way to to practice. Very good thing. And let's look at Twitch. Oh, I think we have some questions on Twitch. Oh. Do, 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 do. Okay. Now we all have a question. But Meek Whale says these are these animals look cute. <laughs> and I guess they're right. Okay, so I have a question for you. When you animate and you have to animate something that you don't know, um, let's say you animate on a, a show or a pilot and they're like, you have to animate fire. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I've never done fire. What would be your first reflex? Because when you're not working or when you're not in school and you have to animate fire, you can always choose the option to not to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you choose to not. Right? So I'm like, oh, I guess I won't. But when it's your work or your school, you have to do it. So then how do you find a way out? <laughs> what is your uh, little go-to for things like that? Definitely the first thing I would do if it's in a group project and you have like a director mm -hmm. who's telling you what they do and they have a vision for it, I'd ask them if they have any inspiration in general. Maybe you get sent a still image or a GIF or you're told, hey, I really like the graphic style of some of the effects in this movie, or I like the really flowy effects in that movie. So you have sort of something to start off of when you do your research, and then just start digging into things that are similar, try and break down some of the shapes. Or even just like creative problem solving, like when I had to do smoke, there's a pen here somewhere. Oh, it's brush tool, wrong tool. It could use the calligraphy brush to help draft out the smoke. So instead of trying to go this way again, pick a shape or if you have, you know, base the smoke there. And you want it to be wispy going up. It can be a bit difficult to try and keep the width consistent if you're making a whole bunch of frames and the smoke is getting higher and you're not paying attention, then it just doesn't look good but you can be clever and use a calligraphy brush to make it thicker and use that to help determine the thickness of it. So then you can work smarter and not harder. You, that, that works great. Oh, by the way, my question was not for fire specifically. It was just more like, you know, anything you have to animate and you don't know. <laughs> yeah, like creative problem solving. See if there are tools available that make it easier instead of just picking the first thing that shows up thinking, oh, there's fire. I'm going to draw it. I need to turn the stabilizer down. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you think, okay, maybe that's what fire looks like to one person, but somebody else would rather have it more jagged and pointy. Yeah. Whenever I have something to do, like I, I worked on a pilot, yeah, two weeks ago, and the person was like, oh, you have to do fire. I'm like, clarification please they're like yeah fire i'm like find me three image references of the fire you want and i'll do something <laughs> so folks like we said before it's okay not to know but it's okay to also ask for clarification clarific clarification because if someone is like animate a bat or animate a fire it is okay to ask can you provide me with a reference of what you want because i can animate a fire michelle can animate a fire and it will not be the same they will both be right. They will just not be the right one. <laughs> so always ask for references. That is a good a good point. I, I would have forgot about that. So yeah, ask for reference. Mm -hmm. Saves you a ton of time as well. Because if you, you try and work on your fire, it's something that's slow. You need to do a bunch of in-betweens. Maybe you make it so it loops. You've got 70 frames. And then you do all that work. You clean it up. You send it in for thoughts. Say, I don't like the style. Now you have to redo it the whole thing. <laughs> all gone because yes uh, oftentimes when we ask these kind of questions the first reflex is oh i'll go i'll go look for references but like don't don't like remember you work for someone else in that case you shouldn't have to look for the reference first like someone is going to tell you what the style after you know what the style is then yes you can find references of like the motion <laughs> of that specific thing Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know for you, but whenever I find references, either of a running animal or like a jumping thing or an FX, uh, I think one of the mistakes I did when I was younger <laughs> is I would kind of watch the video on really slow motion and then just reproduce what I saw. But it's I, I discovered by doing like it's so important to also watch it at the actual speed because this is how you see what details are important. I don't know, I feel if you we only rely on frame by frame references, you lack the motion, but I don't know, maybe that's me. What do you think? I think it can help if you're trying to understand the anatomy of how something moves. Like when you see a cat that walks really, really quickly across the floor, maybe you aren't paying attention to when you know its foot flicks back and trying to draw too fast here. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think what you mean is that if it's to study like the, the motion, like how the body moves uh, frame by frame is amazing because then you actually know when it's touching the ground. Like the, how do yeah. you call it in English, the, the step the step frame or something? Uh, the contact position. Contact position. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's like even when that foot, if the heel comes first and then the toe comes down or when it's coming off the back, I think, especially like with live action reference, you see that it takes longer in the air and it goes quick across the ground. Mm -hmm. If you watch it too slowly, you might be inclined to just evenly space it all the way along because you're watching it really slowly. So your brain is processing it really slowly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why I like to keep a kind of a balance of yes, frame by frame, but press play once in a while to actually see what is important in that. Um, mm -hmm. language and just um, taking a step back helps too like when I was working with the the dog again maybe it's just because I was staring at it too long but <laughs> it was a sprint so it doesn't have some of the frames that a run has it, yep. it goes fast so Kiwi's feet aren't on the ground very long but there's a pause here where it gets a lot slower and for a while I would stare at that section and be like is it moving too slow? But it just became a thing of <laughs> removing frames and adding frames, like exposure, I guess, until I thought, well, it looks about right. So some things you just have to eyeball. Yep. I think like contact positions are usually very important, but when we animate, it's a bit like when you do life drawing or figure drawing, it's like, well, you were gonna do a 30 second pose, a one minute pose. So when I when I learn animation, I'm also looking at yes, the video frame by frame. But sometimes I play it and I try to remember just what was important, and uh, it helped me a couple of times. Like try to 
look at a video and then try to catch the motion just in straight ahead or little motion, just like one leg at a time to see what's the important part. Eh, to me, it helped solve some things. I thought I'd share. <laughs> yeah, I think it helps. Um, then you're picking out the key poses that way, kind of, and filling in the rest. Yeah, like I would, I would, I would try to remember what the pose was, draw it, and then correct it by looking at the frame by frame, being like, "Oh, I was wrong," because it <laughs> helps. Because then some of the film was right, so the thing that where I was right, I wrote a list about it. But then you can just adjust what was wrong. Yeah, it helped me. Oh, we have questions in the chat. Ta -da -da. So, Question. in my pocket, ask what is the hardest things you guys had to animate. Um. Hmm. The hardest thing I've tried to animate. Ooh. I think the hardest thing I've tried to animate was a dance sequence. I remember thinking oh. that could be one of my final projects in college because we had to pick three final projects to work on. And mm -hmm. I thought, hey, it'd be really cool to work on a dance sequence. I can pick an animal. That way it's not crazy complex with fabric flying everywhere like it might be for a person. But I just wasn't mm -hmm. there yet. I, I couldn't figure it out. I was still working on the <laughs> cards. I'm like, it's not working, but I'll put it down. That's okay. <laughs> Try something I think else. The hardest thing I animated was like a. I worked on anime pilot and I had to animate anime characters. And it was like, oh my God, so much details, too much ruffles. <laughs> Never want to do it again. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think that'd be really oh. challenging. You can see how they do like the insane detail on the hands that looks so realistic. Yeah. And it was like action sequences because usually animes it's like <laughs> it's like a still frame with a moving mouth most of the time. But then you have these crazy action sequences, and that is all we did because it was a pilot, so that was hard. That was very, very hard. <laughs> um oh, another question. Do you manage uh, it's from Stepenfeno. Yeah, Stepenfeno. Do you manage to do you manage to include that space chart into studios when you work there? My answer is yes. Question mark. Yeah, you can include space charts in studios. It just depends on the studio. Because if you put a time chart and nobody knows how to read it, then it's you're better off not doing it. How about you, Sormsar? Yeah, the projects I've worked on so far, well, if I'm handed roughs or effects. I'm the one doing it. So anything I start, I finish kind of. So if I'd be doing the roughs for a shot, I would complete all of the roughs until the end of the shot. And then I'd go in and I'd mark my keyframes, mark my breakdowns. And if I had any extra notes, I might scribble them on the side or in the node view, I might scribble some notes. X sheet might scribble some notes, make it as easy as possible for whoever picks up the shot to know what's going on. Yeah, I don't think it's ever been something that stopped me from putting a little timing chart on the side, being like, hey, I want this cat to jump. It's going to jump my way instead of <laughs> straight way. So yeah, just do whatever works best for you as long as the shot's accomplishing what it needs to. Yep. Hey, pa time goes by so fast. It's already like there's only 10 minutes left, barely. So... Oh. We're doing great. Um, oh, someone says in the YouTube chat, uh, it's Juan Barrio who says, do you guys have some other tricks instead of recorded reference to deal with organic animation? Okay, I think I get the question. I think if I understand the question, uh, they're asking if we know other tricks uh, to find reference instead of recording our own references to deal with organic animation? Um, in a way, I would say coming to understand what you're animating would let you imagine it in a realistic way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need to have a reference of a cat jumping to know that it needs to, like, curl up. It probably needs a, another pose down here where its butt goes in the air more <laughs> before it jumps. That it tucks its legs in, pulls it out before it lands. Oh, and also, if you can't find a reference for that specific animal or specific thing you're doing, like let's say, I need to animate some someone falling off a boat. 
well maybe you can find someone falling off something else like maybe like a maybe that's a bad example but it's just like yeah. when, when they record their own references like they don't have a boat they're gonna fall off their couch or something but sometimes it's just emotion you don't need it to be that precise of a reference someone falling is someone falling so <laughs> and that's a good point like it, it gets too specific online you might not find what you're looking for the, the world's a big place, so something relevant should be out there somewhere. And one of my biggest tips I can give for that, that helped me so much, because I don't have a good visual memory, or like, I, I always struggle with animation and drawing, because visually, I'm not great. Like, I don't imagine things that way. Like, you know how people, they just look at a picture and they can just reproduce it after without looking at it? Like, photo memory? I don't have that. But if I make the motion myself, it helps me animate it. Or, like, I can animate cats and dogs easy because I have ones and I'm around them all day and I kind of know how they locomote around, <laughs> if that's a word. I don't think that's a word, but I don't care. Um, so make the motion yourself can sometimes help. Like you want to animate someone tripping. Well, try to trip yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> Carefully with, with cushions. Oh, but that being said, um, leave expertise to the experts. You want to animate a sword fight? You are the worst reference possible for a sword fight. Don't, don't try to choreograph your own sword fight with your friend you guys don't know how to fight with swords you're just gonna have a weird result like what is highly specific things like that uh, always try to find reference of actual professional doing it after that you can walk through the motion and see how it moves but like to to understand like how to do horseback riding you don't know how to ride a horse you don't know that so look at the reference for things you don't understand but for motion you can try to kind of do it uh, also mimic the the thing and it should help you understand it wait did it make sense yeah i think hmm. it's a good point like that was one of my arguments when it came to college is every single project they wanted you to have video reference like you need to record <laughs> yourself you need to include it as your submission which i do it but i would take the video and then ignore it because I'm yeah, not we're actor. so awkward. Yeah, yeah we get awkward actor. when there's a camera. So in a way, if I were to reference the video that I took of myself, my animation would look awful because I'm not an actor. I don't know how to create those like arcs and shapes and dramatic performances that I can think of, but not necessarily do myself. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, another question uh, from YouTube again. It's Edwin Hernandez who says, a movie or animated series you recommend to study? There's so many. <laughs> Just pick one. <laughs> if you're looking for studying human anatomy, I found Atlantis and Tarzan were really helpful. Because Atlantis oh, had yeah. a very geometric style and Tarzan was more gesture drawing-ish, but it still mm -hmm. simplified it in a way... And it had a lot of different angles. It simplified it in a way that I found digestible. Yeah. Good point. Hmm. Oh, one that I like to study with is Avatar The Last Airbender. Not for everything, but they have a very good way of... Um, of like, if you look at the character and they do like these cool poses and move sometimes they're not too they're not they're a bit far away from the camera and the way that they schematize and simplify these silhouettes and moves on uh, on some frames it's amazing like watching avatar frame by frame is good because they they have a great way of simplifying uh, otherwise complex motions and moves um Oh, someone says this live is giving when, well, Julia Perez said, or Julia Perez says this live stream is giving when two queens come together to maximize their joint slay. Oh my God. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> <That's extra energy. laughs> wow. <laughs> I needed that energy. Um, yeah. Oh, that's very nice. 
I love that animation, by the way. It's super cool with nice arcs and stuff. Oh, arcs. We forgot to talk about arcs. They're so important. They I think we are. can make a little we can make a little thing about it. Yeah. Uh, you know how when people start to animate, they do everything kind of from A to B in a straight line. This is why you know they're just starting out. They do not do arcs. <laughs> you want straight to talk up. a little bit about arcs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I have my little owl come back. Wherever my line Come is. back, owl. <laughs> I try to move him in an arc. If you can kind of see the onion skin, he arcs to the right. And then under a little bit, scoops back over in a figure eight. Down he goes. So he's never moving in a straight line. Much more organic. Boop. Boop. Yep. Yeah, that's another reason I like doing my timing charts with curves in them. Is it reminds me which direction I'm arcing. So if you're doing a oh, lot yeah. of like, tedious in-betweens... I think it can be easy to start, you have your key, you have your other key, your breakdown, and you start doing this a little bit, and it ruins it, because it's jittering all over the place. They yep. go like that. I remember when I'm working on, you have a bunch of frames. If I'm working on this frame, I know that I need to push all of the details this way. Yeah, sometimes straight like it's not to say that straight lines are completely forbidden, so that know when you use them, like it needs to be for something very specific. So. Oh, yeah, like impact frames or something. Like if you're oh, landing yeah. heavy, or if some if the character is throwing a punch or something. But oftentimes it's gonna be a straight line, and then the reception or the anticipation will be an arc. So now your arcs, folks. I'm gonna yeah, check on the side. Angry cat if we have a question. No. Stab somebody. Very angry loaf. I would use a straight line there to just womp it down. Straight. I'm just looking at your drawing. <laughs> <laughs> My very bad, speedy sketch of a gonna bad it. <laughs> and yeah, so arcs are not only into your movement; they're also into your poses. Like if you have a character standing up, don't don't just make them stand up with their hands behind their back. Like you can give them a little sway in the hips that they're standing on and stuff. So, yeah, make it make it move, make it groove. And uh, I think that'll be our last minute or last words. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, um, last thoughts. Hmm. I'd say remember to draw for yourself when you're doing it. There's a lot of social yeah. media stuff out there, and it's easy to draw. The oh, algorithm really picks nice. something up, and then you get all of this feedback. You think, oh, everybody really likes this post, and then you can't draw anything else because you feel trapped by it. Pick up a pencil, and you go, oh, no, is it going to be good enough? So you stop drawing. Not good. Yeah, I thought, I don't know, because I'm not on... I mean, I don't think, I don't think either of us are very active on any social media so i don't know yeah, i've like, done it on purpose my... stay away from it right right well say like I, my instagram is i don't care about it that much twitter either um I, I care about discord with you guys because i'm close to you and we all cheer for each other and help but just remember folks the amount of like your post has like i hope it doesn't matter that much to you because I don't like I don't think anyone should value their art with the amount of likes it gets because like Michelle said like the <laughs> algorithm has so much to do with it and you can have a wonderful thing get completely ignored and it doesn't make it less worthy it's just that's just how the world is so if you do something that you like even if it doesn't get a thousand like at least you would have 
liked it and have fun. So draw for you and I, I, I don't know, like guys, stop pursuing the the, 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 the algorithm and fame. Like, I don't know. I, I don't think it should. it's healthy to have it as a goal. It's like if you're a singing artist, your goal is to be the next Ariana Grande. Like there's so much luck involved into this. So it's not just talent. There is luck. So just just be kind to yourself and uh, draw draw things you like. And if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, you'll still be happy in the journey. I don't know if that made sense, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep it <laughs> relatively stress free. Yeah. Doodle fun things. And surround yourself with lovely people. Avoid the toxic mess. <laughs> little advice for these, uh, this little end of year time. So, yeah, we. I wish you a wonderful time, uh, Michelle, with your lovely animation. And everybody who's watching, I also hope you're going to have a very nice end of year. Because I think that's my last stream for this year. Oh, my God. Oh, the end is near. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. two weeks left? I think. Yeah, three maybe if you're like two and a half weeks. And uh, yeah. So any any last thing to add? Well, I guess happy holidays to everyone who celebrates. <laughs> yeah. We had some snow. And if you don't celebrate the holidays, happy time off perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have a lovely end of day, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya.